Good morning. How are we doing today? Good morning. How are we doing today? Good morning. I'm fine. Thanks, Daniel. Great, 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 great. So we all we all managing to power through the end of the semester. Train. Understandable, understandable. Um, all right, so how do you guys feel about where we are in the course? You feel like you're keeping up, that you're falling behind? For me, I, I'm getting there. It's, it's, mm -hmm. a, it's a process. I think after the midterms, everything just happened so fast. You had midterms coming left, right, and center. Mm -hmm. So it's just for me to catch up on what would have happened during that time. Yeah. Um, and this is, you know, this is a theme that I hear from a lot of students, and um, it troubles me to some extent, not because, not because there's anything wrong with focusing on assessments, but because if you're planning to enter into the practice, right, if you're planning to try and actually, you know, become, uh, you know, be called to the bar, that juggling a number of, um, you know, juggling a lot of projects is going to become part of your professional life. And um, there's going to be situations where you are being tasked with, um, with a lot of things all at once and you have to be able to manage that process. And some of that may involve you know, prioritizing, which is certainly uh, something that I, I think you guys were doing. Um, and some of it may involve um, being able to work on multiple things at once. And um, you know, I don't uh, I don't necessarily encourage you to, you know, I, I know I've, I've said before, I don't encourage you to work a lot, you know, to work enormous hours and to, to really struggle to, to put in unnecessary time, but it really is important to put in the necessary time. Um, it sounds like you guys, you know, your past uh, all your midterm assessments and that you have a, a plan in place for how you're going to be playing catch up. Would, is that, does anyone, does anyone feel like they don't have a plan that they don't know what they're going to do? No, we're everybody. Everybody knows how they're going to keep up for the rest of the semester. Okay. Okay. Let me let me let me ask what may be a spectacularly dumb question. Okay. I feel like a lot. There's a lot of times when if I ask a question and the answer is no, that I get silence from students. And 
if I ask the same question, but I reverse how it's framed so that the answer is yes, then students answer the question. And I'm wondering if there, there's some sort of uh, cultural disconnect where I, where you guys have been taught not to say no. Is, is there something, is there something that I'm missing here? I honestly don't know why we do that, <laughs> but I guess we just mean like, okay, it's no, so you'll see that nobody responds, I guess, I don't know. So, so here's a serious question. How do I tell the difference in a Zoom classroom where I'm sort of teaching to the abyss, right? How do I tell the difference between a classroom full of no's and a classroom full of people who are not paying attention? True. So, you know, maybe this is one of those things where we, we transported a, a norm from face-to-face -face into online teaching that doesn't work. And that's, and, and I'm not criticizing, I'm just noting that like, can't speak for the rest of my colleagues. When I ask a question, I'm actually looking for an answer. I, I don't always know how to interpret silence, right? So that um, if, you, if you know the answer, I want you to give me the answer, like, I usually interpret silence as I need to wait because people are thinking. So, um, okay. All of that, you know, this, this has all been, been said. I think you guys get the point. No, no need to belabor it any further. Let's um, continue on and let's have a conversation about the, uh, the question for today's tutorial. It's posted on e-learning um, and it's about nuisance. So let me let me ask you guys, right? We have this this neighbor who has built a very tall fence and it has uh, obstructed Albert's view. What can Albert do? Okay, Keandre says he can bring a claim. Why do you think he can bring a claim? We'll, we'll come back to Tyreek's point in just a minute. Let's let's hear what Keandre says. Keandre says the fence is disrupting his enjoyment of the property. So how so? Okay. How does that sound in the ways that we talk about the uh, the in the way that we measure the interference in property? Not quite sure, right? So can anybody help Keandre out? Can you repeat the question? So Keandre's taken the position that the fence is disrupting uh, Albert's enjoyment of the property by affecting the view. And so I'm asking, how do we express this in the terms and the ways that 
we talk about interference in nuisance based on what we talked about last week in the lecture. Well, think about it, think about it like this. Let's go back to last week's lecture. How do nuisance claims, how do courts measure the interference? Um, is that about like if the inconvenience is more than fanciful? Okay, so you sensible, right? What does it mean for it to be sensible? Tariq, I see your, your comment. We'll come to that in a minute. What does it mean for it to be sensible? Like it, the inconvenience is interfering. So this is so this is a dangerous, this is a dangerous concept. Let me let me explain why we are used to thinking of the term sensible as meaning reflecting the use of common sense, okay? Whereas the term sensible as it is used in this particular analysis is perhaps better spelled the way that I just put it into the chat in that it is capable of being perceived with the senses. And so when, when you see uh, a court asking, is the interference sensible? You should read that as, is the interference sensible? Okay, so that, that's, that's one of the things that is, is, can, can be difficult about these analyses is recognizing that this term is not being used in a way that we're, we're used to it being used, right? So um, what does it mean, you know, how do courts determine whether an interference is capable of being perceived by the senses? What does the court mean when it asks, can we perceive the interference with our senses? That is correct. Yeah, pretty much, right? So, so what it means is that like, the, the sensible term is most properly used in encroachment and injury cases. Okay, so what it means is that if you have a tree that has put roots across the property line, but you can't tell that it's there, that's not a nuisance, that's not an encroachment because nothing's happened to to you you haven't been harmed it's just there's the tree has has come across the property line uh in an insensible way 
Okay. But if I build a fence across the property line, this is this is something that we are capable of perceiving, right? And the measure the measure for whether a uh, an interference is sensible, right, is capable of being perceived by the senses, is whether it has diminished property values. So can we, can we see a diminishment, can we see a lowering of the assessed property value of the property? So do you think that that's happening in Albert's case? Okay, so we have a disagreement. Tyreek, you say no. Why do you say no? Sir, because in my reading, I didn't um, see anything with regards to viewing. Uh, so looking at the report, I recognize smell, they recognize fumes, etc., but they don't recognize views, um, at least from what I've read. Okay, so Tyreek says that he can't find any authorities that support the notion of um, of this uh, of this doctrine. Vintia says, you know, Keandre says that people pay more based on a beach view. Vintia says that it seems to diminish the property value. Um, there is, right? There is a property doctrine that you will not learn about in property one. Um, so don't worry about it for now, but it's a right to light. And so there may be claims that sound in nuisance that, um, that represent, you know, sort of obstructions of light, you know, eh. All of these are things that will affect the, uh, the possibility of the claim going forward, but I think that you guys are right to see that this is a, an open question, okay? Because this is not, like, this is not a case that, um, is unheard of, right? There is a, an entire class of cases regarding what are called spite fences, where a neighbor puts up a very tall fence, taller than they would reasonably need for, pro, for, for privacy purposes, and it obstructs their, their neighbor's view. And the neighbor complains about it and in some jurisdictions, we have seen uh, courts take Tyreek's position that, you know, there's no inherent right to a view. Um, and so the, there's no, you know, there's no claim here. And then the, there are other jurisdictions where they take the position that Keandre and Vincia have taken, where they say, look, you know, it's a diminishment of property value. It sounds a nuisance. We are, we're going to allow the claim to go forward, right? Um, the difference, I think, lies in the kinds of remedies that you ask for. I think that cases where the plaintiff is demanding some sort of injunction, right, an order directing the fence to come down and not be re-erected, I think courts are very skeptical of those claims where the plaintiff is asking for damages based on the diminished property value, right? When I want to sell this land, I won't be able to get as much for it because the buyer won't be able to see this beautiful ocean view, right? Those claims are more viable, right? So the, it's a situation where the remedies you ask for affect 
the viability of the claim. And, and the key piece of this, the thing that I want to drive home about this is the fact that all of this is an integrated whole, right? The way that these claims are analyzed is as a whole, as a totality of the circumstances. And so it's not just, was there a sensible or substantial interference, but it's also, what are you asking the court to order, right? Is it reasonable to make that demand? And that's, remember, that's the second piece of the nuisance analysis is, is the defendant's action reasonable? And so I ask you guys, is a nine foot fence reasonable? There's some disagreement. I think that's, I think that's fair. I think there are circumstances where, you know, a nine foot fence might make sense, right? There are going to be other circumstances where maybe it's not. So Keandre says he's not even nine foot. Um, for those of you who think that a nine foot fence is reasonable, how tall a fence would, would be unreasonable? Would 10 feet be unreasonable? How about 15? What an awful pun, Vincia. <laughs> uh, so, but I, I think, you know, there's a, there's a couple of different pieces here, right, that, you know, the, the plaintiff absolutely has to prove the diminishment of the property value or the substantial interference. And Caleb says, wouldn't we have to go with the norm in the neighborhood? Well, what is the norm in the neighborhood? How do we define it? Is, is the norm in the neighborhood uh, contained in the fact pattern? So I think Caleb's right that, you know, certainly one of the puzzles in these analyses is what do, you know, what, what does the community sort of expect? Right. And this was one of the things that we talked about last week, where we talked about the fact that sometimes a nuisance analysis can boil down to poor people don't deserve to have nice things. Right. Um, but why do we think that that's okay? Or do we think that's okay? I guess is a is a fair question. Can you say that again? Sure. Why does the nature of the neighborhood, why does the norm of the neighborhood matter if what it really means is um, we just don't, uh, we, we don't, uh, we don't think poor people deserve nice things. So, so are higher fences more reasonable in places where uh, where people don't expect to have 
ocean views. So there's, go ahead, Caleb. Um, sir, so um, other than the nature locality, wouldn't we still have to look at um, what was the purpose of the fence in the sense that is it, does the body want the fence higher um, for security purposes? And if that the reasonableness in terms of the, um, what the Narmi neighborhood wouldn't somewhat apply because he is taking uh, a precautionary method to um, safeguard himself. So then reason this in that sense wouldn't really apply because if you get from coming from sir. Well, why, why wouldn't, it sounds to me like you are engaged in exactly a reasonableness analysis. How is, how is that not of the question of whether the defendant is being reasonable? What I'm trying to say, sir, is that when I said um, the taking um, into account what is the norm within the neighborhood, um, I'm saying, well, let me look at the neighborhood. Let me look at see what is the what is the norm in terms of reasonableness in terms of defense. But what I'm trying to say is then, um, let me say, for example, there's a there's um, a spike in um, crimes, or uh, um, people are breaking in, and he's he, he's then take it upon himself. To say, well, hey, I'm gonna um um at my house because it's a big house. I'm gonna need a bigger fence. So, so even though that that may not be the norm, I'm just taking this precautionary method to safeguard myself. So my, but my question is still like I don't disagree with anything that you're saying. My question is still at the end. You're like reasonableness doesn't come into it, and I'm asking, how is what you're saying not asking the question? Is the defendant being reasonable? That I cannot answer. <laughs> the The answer is you're. That's exactly what you're doing, right? You are engaged in a reasonableness analysis, and and that's fine, right? I just I want to make sure that we're we're identifying what we're what we're doing correctly, right? That we're not saying that the reasonableness of the defendant doesn't matter. We're actually cracking that open and asking whether the defendant is being reasonable under the circumstances. So, um, I mean, uh, so the, the key piece of all of this, right, the thing that I, I want to um, sort of drive home for you guys is that there's a couple of different pieces to this puzzle for whether Albert has a claim against his neighbor, right? And, and you've identified all of them sort of in, in dribs and drabs and bits and pieces, and, and that's fine, right? Here's my job to put it all back together for you. In that, if he can show that there's been some sort of reduction in the property value, or if he can show that it is normal and ordinary for people to be able to look upon ocean vistas from their, from their home, okay? Maybe, maybe no one else in the neighborhood has their view obstructed. Everyone else can see the ocean except for him. Maybe that's possible. Um, then maybe, right, maybe he has shown an invasion into his enjoyment of of his own property and then we move on to ask okay was it reasonable for the neighbor to build this nine foot high fence right you guys have pointed out that there may be circumstances where it would be reasonable right maybe there's been a sudden uptick in crime and the the neighbor's concerned about deterring burglars right Maybe he's decided that he wants to uh, live a 
nudist lifestyle and he doesn't want to subject his neighbors to that, right? Maybe that's, you know, there, there are reasonable explanations for why the neighbor might want to put up a nine foot high fence. Um, but the question of what those explanations might be are going to be, that's going to be a very fact intensive process, right? That the court's going to have to really inquire into. So Keandre, go, go ahead. Based on my understanding, right? I understand the, the reasoning that we are trying to put across, but what I know is that um, whatever you decide to do on your property, it should not affect somebody else's. So even if, let's say, like you said, he plans to live a nudist lifestyle or whatever his reason is, his, whatever he decides to do on his property shouldn't enjoy, I mean, shouldn't infringe on my enjoyment of my property. So that's why I said that I think that um, the guy would be able to bring, to bring a claim. So, so I, I, guess, I guess this is a serious question, right? <laughs> would, would seeing your neighbor naked uh, substantially impact your enjoyment of your property? For me, no. Do you think that a reasonable person <laughs> So suddenly folks are, uh, are concerned. Um, if, I have, think... if I have an ocean view, I, I don't have to look at you naked. I can look at the ocean without looking at you. So if you want to come <laughs> to naked, that's on you. But it, is Albert the only neighbor that I have to be concerned about? Maybe not. Right? Maybe I have other neighbors. So right. would a reason so so and, and this is not to suggest that Keandre is unreasonable, but do we think that a reasonable person would would be disturbed by on a regular basis seeing their neighbor minus clothes? The, the yeah. truth Possibly, right? If they have children and stuff, they'll feel disturbed. Yeah, but Dr. Kerr. The neighbor needs to control himself. <laughs> exactly. If you want to live a nudist lifestyle, uh, live that in your house. When exactly. You live in isolation. <laughs> you don't do that out here. You live naked in your house. So, so what you're saying is that... Um, it that that this particular uh, life choice is is one that is per se unacceptable uh, to to carry on um, except behind closed doors. I would say yes because I okay. don't think I'm so. I'm going to add curtains to my shopping list. Um, no, but I don't think you're allowed to go. I can't just take off my clothes and go outside walking naked. No, I'm pretty sure I can't do that. So I don't but, think it would be um, unreasonable for me to say that you should practice that lifestyle inside your house. If you want to but have my, no curtains, but my, you're walking but my, in your house, that's all you. <laughs> but my point, my point is that the neighbor is being respectful of the community norm to keep that sort of keep, keep that lifestyle tucked away right they've put up a fence and so is that unreasonable dr Kerr, i want i want to i want to say what you said just now i think considering my neighbor what would have been reasonable was for them to add curtains to their house that way it won't affect my enjoyment of my property or your enjoyment of your lifestyle. From you erecting a high fence, that infringes on my enjoyment of my property. Because if I paid for this property, let's say, maybe I don't like the house, I paid for it just for the view, then you start to affect my enjoyment of my property. So if you want to live naked, then put fence, um, um, put some curtains up and walk around naked in your house. That, that doesn't affect any of us. Okay. So I think that this is a reasonable analysis that you've offered, right? Again, 
this is a these cases are very fact intensive and so i can see you know i don't think it's unreasonable to come out on the other side either right and to say look you know um the the uh the naked neighbor is entitled to be naked on their property and they're being respectful of community norms by making it so that you can't you can't see them being naked on their property and that is a reasonable choice for the defendant to make right so i i think that um i i don't disagree with your analysis i also think that this i think the zone of reasonableness encompasses a decision on both sides of this issue does that make sense yes it does okay so, and I think, I think that some of it depends on sort of how you emphasize the facts of the case and what you think is important, right? So clearly you see this ocean view as very important and you are taking this position that um, there's very much a, uh, like you're, you're thinking of the property owner as someone who is really dedicated to this view and maybe maybe the house itself isn't really that great, right? Maybe it's kind of a rundown fixer upper, but it's got this fantastic view. And now you've taken that away from them, right? And so I think, I think if you emphasize that as, as the key fact, then yes, you, you sort of come to the, to the conclusion that maybe this is unreasonable on these facts. But if you emphasize the fact of, you know, you have the right to make lawful use of your property as long as you're respecting community norms, as long as you are not unreasonably interfering with others' use of the property, and you, you, you sort of emphasize the defendant's rights, then you can come down on the other side of the case, right? So does that, does that make sense? How sort of, you know, the, the, the way you come at the case can color the decision that you make without changing any of the facts that that go into it or changing any of the law. So if this troubles you, if you feel like this is um, suggesting that law is very contingent, good. That's been more or less what I've been trying to communicate all semester. <laughs> But uh, I think I think that we've we've sort of come down on this, and and I I, I appreciate you guys engaging with this. So, what questions do you have about about this? We'll we'll wrap up a little early if we need to. Well, sir. Yes, go ahead. Sally. You're saying it is not then every interference will constitute a nuisance then. Yeah, that's absolutely okay. correct, right? Because uh, if if the defendant didn't do anything unreasonable, then the court's going to say, "Sorry, plaintiff, you know, this is just this is the price of living in a society." Right? This is sort of like what we were talking about yesterday with regard to battery, right? And the issue of, you know, someone dancing up on you when during carnival right? That's just, that's something that you expect. And it's part of being, of living in a society. It's part of participating in this, you know, in, in this community is that these kinds of things will happen. And, um, and the, the, the issue becomes when someone's unreasonable about it. Okay. So, yeah. So, so it's basically dependent on um, what is measured by the standard of a reasonable or ordinary person. Yep. Okay. Yep. Thanks. No problem. Okay. What other questions do we have? No questions. Great. Okay. Okay. Anybody, anybody else have questions?
Going once, going twice. Okay, so let's wrap this, uh, this session up a little early and we will uh, call it a day. So I will see you guys tomorrow. So take care and uh, we'll, we'll continue our discussion of trespass against the person tomorrow. So take care and bye.